I think any creative process where you're making something out of nothing, knowing when to let it go and like when to hold it close is totally just in your gut. <laughs> it's totally intuitive. Whether they're just words and thoughts or music. We live in a world where it's really easy to kind of like take it and like put it out there. Technology kind of makes it that way. I personally have always resisted that urge just because I wanted to make sure that what I was putting out into the world was representative of who I am. I think it was good to incubate a little bit, but there was this moment of like, if you want to be a solo musician, you can't always hold it in. You sometimes have to like make yourself vulnerable and also make the work vulnerable. My name's Jesse Hale Moore, and I'm here recording my song Enter Light for an episode of Shaking Through. So, on this session, I was lucky enough to have so many incredible musicians. On drums, I had Patrick Berkeley. On electric guitar, I had Colin Pate, Todd Irk on the bass guitar, and Eliza Hardy Jones on keys and harmonies. Here, put your arms through. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> She's just such a fierce musician and friend and really stepped into this session with her like A game. I also don't know like how attached you are to this specific demo arrangement. If you want it to be like you want these lines and you want them to be where they are or if it's more just like these were it's probably somewhere in the middle of those two things. You know, like there are a lot of things about the demo that I'd like to keep melodically, but I'm also like not married to anything. The truth is Everybody came into the day not knowing the song at all. I mean, for right now, you, you, we need to work out just the basic structure of the song, right? Yeah. Like where there's verses, where there's choruses, where the hook happens. Did you guys? Getting them through? to know it well enough to play it is one thing. Getting them to know it well enough to play it with the finer details that it sounds like a finished hit song, that's hard. There's nothing passive about that whatsoever. What Jesse said going into it was, I don't want it to be ballady and I don't want it to be waltzy. But Jesse had originally written the song in 3 4. I heard the demo with no drums. So I was curious where it was going to go. Were we going to sort of apply a ballady, waltzy beat, or were we going to try to like groove it up a little bit? This is right now a real ballady, right? And this is what we were talking about trying to at least explore away from. Yeah. Is there a, a non 3 4 type of way of doing it? Maybe. We were trying to play around with that. Is there like a... It was like this, right? Yeah. To take it out of waltz, we kind of had to reconstruct the feel. It gets it more groove, right? If we can find it like... You know, we kind of need to put it into a little bit more of like 4-4 four, four down tempo soul type of beat. So I moved to Philadelphia like 11 or 12 years ago. I didn't really know yet where I fit in in terms of a music community, but I knew that Philadelphia had a really rich one and I knew that I wanted to find my way into it. At that time, I was writing mainly for guitar and vocals. I wasn't really playing the piano much. And it was fine, but I didn't feel like compelled to like put it out there in the world. Rather than focusing on my own music, I started jamming with people, singing with people, kind of just saying yes <laughs> to everything. I mean, what do you think? Because you, you, you do kind of keep going back to the ballad rhythm just when you play it by yourself. Right, right. Like, I don't want I don't think I don't I wanna... Steer it down a wrong path. Yeah, I don't think it's a wrong path. I think it'll just take me a minute to feel, yeah. to have that feel natural. But this, this isn't the first song of mine that I wrote 3 4 and it turned into 4 4. Okay. For like the sake of the groove and to sure. make it kind of like cooler. Yeah, cool. Okay. Let's try that out. Yeah. yeah. This is gonna be good. So at one point I was in three bands and had like multiple rehearsals a week and multiple shows and you know it felt really active but I wasn't really like digging into my own music. 
I think I sort of allowed playing in other bands to be this sort of like, oh, well, this is what I'm doing now. I'm playing in bands, I'm building my community. And that's really important. I like still think that that was such an important stage, but I don't think you can always create within a vacuum. And I think that's what I was doing. I was kind of creating this bubble around myself. I sort of realized like my ambition has always been to put my own music out there. And so I started really digging into songwriting and found that there was a lot there. A lot of new ideas and new ways that I approached songwriting that weren't there before. I know a lot of that came from the community of people that I had worked with, especially playing with people who are better than you <laughs> in a lot of ways makes you stronger. Aside from writing the music, I also had to think about like what kind of world <laughs> I want that music to exist in or like what does it all mean when all of the pieces start to come together. So that was an uh, exciting and also kind of scary, scary time. Keep going. Pat had this drum set that he's been kind of fixing up for the last couple years. It's a 1943 Slingerland rolling bomber. As many of the parts that can be made out of wood are made out of wood, because it was made during World War II when metal was being rationed. It's got a 26 inch bass drum, which is a big bass drum. And it's awesome in rock music. But the challenge is Pat is playing this very dynamic part with no port cut in the front head. Based upon how Pat was hitting that, it would either be this really long sustained kick or like a tighter, punchier kick and kind of anywhere in between there. What that brought with it is a drum sound that's incredibly varied in certain ways. So we tried a few different methods of dampening the front head and what we arrived at was kind of a kick sound that makes the dynamic range as small as possible. We ended up using two microphones an EV-ND868, which went through an API 312 into the Manly Massive Passive into the Empirical Labs Distressor. And then the 414 went through the MCI console preamp into the Massive Passive. This isn't gonna sound like a sample of a kick drum. Like, it's gonna have variety and diversity based on exactly how Pat hits it. In this day and age, everything is so controlled all the time. It was a great challenge for us to use this drum set that so completely predates thinking like that in any way whatsoever. That's great. Yeah. Let's just use that. It's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So okay, we'll do piano then. Yeah. The Rhodes piano and the acoustic piano, that's two pretty heavy instruments to balance with one another. I think this part needs to just be like fluid and not staccato. Yeah. Yeah. We had to kind of conduct yeah. how busy her parts could get while Jesse's parts were being busy. I could see it having a little more of just a simple pushy patty quality. Like the very rhythm that you sort of told Jesse to play yeah. could be really carried by this. Yeah and maybe a little less arpeggiated in general. Um, Todd had a good idea that we asked that her to keep the chords then? pretty simple, and then we said, flourish out where you feel it. And that's what she did. I think she did a great job with that. So when I started writing the music for Green End, which was my first album, I made these demos that were just piano and vocal, really like live one take demos. Kind of the dream happened in a sense, you know, like your hope is that you make something that people feel compelled to share. And that's kind of what happened. People started sharing them. And through that sharing process, I was connected to a manager and a handful of labels who showed various degrees of interest. The sort of height of that was being flown out to LA a couple times, working with a major record label out there. It was exciting, but it was also really hard to like make sense of how to move forward. It felt very much like if I make the wrong decision here, then I'm going to miss my opportunity. I know that that's not how things are usually, but at the time it did feel like, all right, there's a window opening. I 
don't know why it's opening, but like, you just have to find a way to run through it. I think that was it, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Why don't we quick comp it together? Okay. So come on in. So one of the best examples of wide dynamic range was the guitar. Colin doesn't play with a pick, which means that each hit has a huge likelihood to be different from the last. It's just so when it digs in, it yeah. goes like party, yeah, yeah. Like instead of like, rich. Like, because this is such an open recording, all of those differences in dynamics are like on full display. You can hear every single nuanced detail, which if it's not coming through the way you want it, it's not good. Try a lighter touch if you could. Like that hammer on at the top every time is, is what's falling out of the pocket the most. But that sounds pretty good. Let's just do one more as light as you can possibly do it. Okay, light is better. Yeah. After he started doing that, things kind of locked into place and the sound was just way more consistent. It just made it a lot easier to manage. Everybody that I knew had their own opinion of like what I should be doing. And I appreciated everyone's input, but I was totally incapable of like knowing what to do. And I haven't even recorded anything really, but people wanted to help me craft my sound. And that kind of freaked me out too, because I didn't want my first album to end up being something that didn't feel like me. I ended up deciding to self-produce and work with my band. I needed to learn how to make an album. I'd never done that before. And, you know, when we were actually in the studio, I felt super free of the sort of noise around it. It felt really good to just be like working, making music and being with my friends. In the end, you know, like Green End got a lot of really positive feedback, but the labels who had shown interest before were kind of like, yeah, we're not sure it's like, keep in touch, <laughs> you know? So that led into this whole other thing of like, did I fail? Did I do something wrong? And that's not what you want to feel like after you make an album. I think anybody who makes anything and like really pours their heart into it, there needs to be a moment where you like congratulate yourself for like pushing through a process that's really hard. I think all of the hype that was happening before I'd ever even recorded anything was a difficult place to kind of be writing from. Sort of balancing ambition, which can sometimes fog the clarity that I have as an artist and like what I actually want to be saying and the music that I want to be making. Ultimately, Green End's being listened to, it's being heard. And one of the biggest successes of making it is that I've established myself as a solo artist. I got the ball rolling, and now I get to keep going with it. Uh, we would be interested in hearing you shorten up all the elongated words. Okay. Because when you go up to the who's gonna, right? Uh-huh. It feels like such a payoff. If you're not sort of indulging in the long held out notes in the two lines before that, yeah. first of all, I feel like it'll be easier to feel out the rhythm of it. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's still a little, feels a little dodgy. Yeah. It'll make that going up to the high falsetto head voice thing, so like a real payoff. Cool, yeah, I'm feeling that. So when we first started singing the song, start at the beginning, would sing through to the end. And Jesse was struggling, particularly with the early parts of the song. I think just because he had that sort of dynamic trajectory too firmly lodged in his mind. You feel tired all the time. He was trying to come in softer and at that real soft dynamic, wasn't able to like execute the control that he needed. And so Eliza's idea was, well, let's flip it backwards. Hey, Eliza has an idea. OK. We're going to go backwards. You're going to do the choruses first. OK. Because you sound so fucking great on them. <laughs> and then we're going to do verse three, verse two, verse one. All right. Uh, I and mean, she's right. We're just going to do them piece by piece so that you can really like. Yeah. You don't have to yeah, sing quieter. Right the simpleness of the arrangement can be all the listener needs to detect quietness in the beginning. And the more complex nature of the arrangement by the end is what the listener needs to know that this thing has gone from quiet to loud. The color of nectarines. 
it sort of broke Jesse from having to necessarily think of his full trajectory throughout the whole song. And I think it worked. It's a beautiful vocal performance. Lost without time. The vocals, like, along with everything else, were pretty dynamic, but I'm kind of used to compressing vocals a lot on the way in, like 10 dB or more. So that really helps, like, lessen the dynamic range, kind of right off the bat. Out of the fall. We ended up going with the AEA A440, and that went into an API 312 preamp, into a distressor, and then into a massive passive. Out of the fall. I loved that. Yeah, that was it. I loved that. Cool. That was it. Yeah. You wanna come in? Yeah, come on in. Fuck yeah, dude. It feels really good to be doing this shaking through session because I feel like this is the next stage for me and feeling inspired by the experience of working with people here and working with my friends to just keep going and like write new music and evolve as an artist. Forget. Kind of going back to this idea of like, when do you hold on to something and when do you release it? I don't want to be too precious with this next album because I think ideas and feelings develop and they develop through collaboration. And I want to feel really open to the process and I want to allow that process to really form the sound of this next album. Everything we all do is a work in progress. You develop by letting stuff out. You develop by doing things and showing them to people. I think it's great that he's realizing the importance of that. Learning out in the open. It's been really fun to get to do a session with him for Shaking Through because we get to be a part of that. I feel still really grateful that I have a community of friends and musicians and people in my life who I trust enough to be critical and supportive and loving. And I feel really inspired to kind of take the things that I think with Green End, I hoped were just gonna happen. And rather than like waiting for those things to happen, making them happen for myself. Weathervane's Shaking Through series exists to support self-expression through the creative process of making and recording music. To download the multi-tracks recorded for this or any episode of Shaking Through, or to learn about Weathervane Music, the nonprofit that produces this series, you can follow the links on the screen or go to weathervanemusic.org.